happen. How many people believe for good things to happen? Good things to happen. Good. I, I'm just so happy today. The presence of God, what God is doing in our midst. And I don't know about you. Is it all right to get excited in the house? I'm excited anyhow. Uh, we're going to uh, follow on from last week. And um, just a quick recap. And I believe that um, as we just go through, I'm just going to go through a few things anyhow. We started off last week by talking about Romans chapter 10, uh, where it uh, speaks about um, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And there's something about the word of God that as we listen to it, as we read it, as we absorb it, that it starts to change us. It builds our faith. We start to grow. We start to develop. And I believe that uh, faith is something that we need all, every person needs. Amen. Faith is simply believing what God said he would do, he can do. Whatever he said he could do, he said, I will build my church and that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He said he would give us the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I believe that God wants to do an, uh, exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever imagine or think in our lives. And, uh, but, you know, God wants to do it by his spirit. And I believe he's going to do that. Um, if God is going to touch the Sunshine Coast uh, with his fire... First, he has to put that fire within us. Do you believe that today? So we're speaking about the church and our purpose. When God talks about the church, he's not talking about a building. He's not talking about something with high steeples or goodness knows what else or a bell tower. And when he refers to the church, he's always referring to you and me, living stones, you and me as people of God. So God wants to build us that the gates of Hades will not prevail against. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God made manifest that he might destroy the works of Satan. And so over the last few weeks, weeks the Holy Spirit's been urging us to rise up and take our place and uh, understand that God wants to use us, get rid of the hindrances. One of the great scriptures that we started to use last week was Psalm 110 verse 1. And the uh, text reveals the most amazing conversation between our Father God and His Son Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So God the Father is set upon making Christ's enemies a footstool for His feet. That's what He's going to do. And the interesting part about it, that God is going to use you and I to bring it to pass. God's going to use the church. And this is why we have to rise up and take our place. God himself has chosen to equip his church, his people, uh, to fulfill the promise that he made to his son. He said, son, I want you to come up here and sit with me upon my throne until I make all of your enemies a footstool for your feet. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest that He might destroy the works of Satan. Now God wants to use His body, the church, the Son of God's body, the church, Jesus is the head, we are the body, do you believe that today? To destroy every enemy and fulfill the promise that God made to His Son that every enemy of Jesus Christ will be made a footstool. Do you believe that today? What we've got to believe though is that God wants to use you and me to do it. You know, t today the church, we can, we can sort of, you know, dream dreams and, and, and say, well, God, somehow or other you're going to cause fire to come from heaven. You're going to do this. You're going to do that to cause this revival. No, the revival will start in the church. The revival will start in people like you and me. As we start to get excited, as, as something starts to build on the inside of us, I believe that then we're going to see the great things that God Himself. So God Himself has chosen to equip us, the church, to fulfill His promise to His Son. It's only the truth that will set you free. We've got to hear the truth. If we don't hear the truth, nothing will change. False humility has to go. Amen. Do you believe that today? False humility has to go. Whether you like it or not, God wants to use you. So Father, today we're asking you that you will break through the strongholds that are in our mind. Lord, the things that stop us from understanding, the, the false humility that, that we get around where we, where we say wrong things about ourselves. But Lord, we could come boldly today before the throne of grace. 
Lord, where we could stand up as the children of God, where we could say, my God before me, who can be against me? And Lord, you have anointed me. Just like Jesus stood that day in, the, in that temple and as he stood up and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me. Lord, that we might realize that you have anointed the body of Christ, your church, your people to make every enemy of Jesus Christ a footstool for your son. And my God, I pray that somehow or other the truth would get in and it would break through the hardness and the strongholds that could causes man to think wrong about himself, that we would think about ourselves as you think about us. And my God, you're going to use us in a mighty way in this end time church, this end time revival. You said that there's a latter rain that's coming and the latter rain is going to be poured out upon this just and the unjust. And my God, today we're thanking you for that anointing that will break every stronghold in our thinking and cause the truth to make us free. And everybody that believed it said, Amen. I believe that. God has chosen to equip you and me to become this great end time church. Amen. Lies hold you down. Lies will stop you believing what God wants you to believe. If we can catch this, I believe it will break the walls that the enemy has built around people's lives. God wants to use us whether you believe it or not. Low self-esteem has to go. You are valuable to God. You are very, very precious. You are actually God's prized possession. You are valuable to God. Past failures have to go. What do you think about yourself? You might say, I'm a nobody, I'll never make it. You're killing yourself and your purpose by speaking like that. We have to be careful how we speak because as a person speaks, out of your mouth will come and you'll either live or die by the words that come out of your mouth. Life and death are in our tongue, amen. I would rather say what God says about me than what I feel. How many people know sometimes you just got to stand up there and you just, when you don't feel loved, when you don't feel right, when you don't feel this and when you don't feel that, you just got to stand up there and say, God loves me. God loves me, amen. God loves me so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for me. While I was yet a sinner, God loved me so much that He died for me. I don't believe that any of us can upset God too much, amen. <laughs> He might get disappointed, but He still loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. Past failures, all that stuff. What do you think about yourself? You're killing yourself. You've got to think like God thinks, talk like God talks. When He made man, He said it's very, very good. Do you believe that today? <laughs> so we're coming here right now, going on now, the church, our purpose. The truth is God wants to use you in this great battle that will bring the enemies of Jesus our Lord down. I want you to turn to somebody today and say, God wants to use me. Come on, God wants to use me. Come on, turn to somebody, Come, please do it. God wants to use me. You may not have thought about that before. You may not have even thought that God wants to use you. You might have just thought, I'm just, a, I'm just a nobody. I'm just somebody that goes to church. I just, you know, sing a couple of songs, listen to a message, have a cup of coffee after the meeting, say hello to a few people. No, God wants to use you. And I want to tell you, when you start to realize that and you start to allow God to get around your life, you'd be amazed what God can do. You, you could be the one, that, the catalyst could, that could start an amazing revival that would sweep across the land. When I say that, you think, oh, not me. No, see, that's the enemy saying that. I ought to tell you, all things are possible to those who believe. You could be the catalyst that would spark a revival that could sweep across the whole of Australia. You, you could be the person that could do something. I, I went to a conference once and I came back from that conference totally uh, 
I don't know what, because of things that I'd seen. And the girl that was praying for us, it was, her name was Jill Austin. And she carried an amazing a mantle, an amazing anointing that I hadn't really seen made manifest before as people were slain in the Spirit. People were rolling around, laughing and crying and goodness knows what. People's lives were being changed, transformed. It was an amazing thing. And I saw it and I thought, what is going on here? This poor woman, I don't know how many times she prayed for me. She called me out. She got me in the front. I was rejecting it. I was resisting it. I said, I don't want anything to do with this. But every time I preached, I was preaching what she was doing. (laughs) At this particular conference, I was agreeing with everything, but my mind was having about, how many people know your mind is the battlefield? Anyhow, I, 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 I came home from that conference. I, I, I was watched all this stuff. And uh, as I got up the first week to preach, I, I just waved my arm. And as I did, a heap of people just got slain in the spirit. I nearly fell off the pulpit. <laughs> Something else it went on and on. And from that moment on, that it, it, it was just amazing because I went over to Papua New Guinea and saw an amazing move of God where we had we started with 400 people and ended up with 8,000 people in three nights as God just moved in a miraculous way. How many people know that you could be something that would spark a revival and you don't even know it? And God will start to, this thing, and I came back and I started to speak to, the, to a group of guys. Uh, Bill, you might have even been there. And I waved my hand like that. And as I did, I just said, I want to tell you what happened in Papua New Guinea. As I said that, the whole group got slain in the spirit. They're laying on the floor rolling. And for about four days, they never got up off the floor. There was a girl, it was a girl guides hall or, or something like that, I think at Redland Plains. And there was a girl that was uh, weeding the garden and she was watching us. She weeded that garden for three days. She never moved for more than three foot because she could see through the door and she could watch what was going on. It was hysterical. But I want to tell you, God was moving by Spirit. And I want to tell you, I had no idea what God was going to do, but that sent a ripple right through out uh, every church on the Christian Outreach Centre circuit, when it went right through the whole of Australia. It touched something, and here I am, I'm resisting it. But friend, I want to tell you, you could be sitting there today resisting something, but I want to tell you, if you can grab hold of what God wants to do in your life, you could be the catalyst that could spark a revival that could move right across Australia into the Pacific Islands and goodness knows what else. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that because I I believe that we are all possibilities. All things are possible to those who believe. If you can believe it, it will happen to you. So God wants to use us in this great end time revival. In John 14, 12, Jesus speaking, He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. You see, God has empowered us with the mighty Holy Spirit to overcome every enemy that the enemy would throw at us. Jesus went back to the Father and He sent the Holy Spirit. In Revelation, God's speaking to the churches. See, there's a time here as, as, you know, as a prophet, as He went up there into the presence of God and God started to reveal things to Him. And and as He started to reveal things to Him, He said to to this church and to that church and to this church and to that church, I ought to tell you, God is very, very interested in the church. We can be interested in what's happening on with the the, the financial and the Dow Jones and all these other things. But I want to tell you, God has got His eye on the church. He's got His eye on you and on me. And I believe that there's a drawing power of the Holy Spirit that's starting to quicken and shaken and get inside of us and starting to stir us and shake us a little bit, amen, that we'll start to take attention and we'll start to say, God, I believe that you can use me. And you start to go out and do something and you'll be amazed what God will do through your life. You'll be amazed what God can do because God has got His eye on the church. And in Revelation, God speaking to the church is saying, number one, you have left your first love. Friend, I want to tell you, it's very, very easy when the presence of God lifts, 
when people get so conscious of circumstances and situations and, and the world system and, and we get so involved with trying to fix everything up or trying to make it in life or trying to get that new car or that new house or that new this and all these things start to cloud your mind. The Bible says this very, very clearly. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these other things shall be added unto you. And I believe that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. And we can go seeking after those things. But I want to tell you, the church of God is going to come back to what God wants us to be like. To be God seekers, amen. And then watch the blessing of God come upon us. Do you believe that today? I honestly believe that God wants to break some things down. And He's speaking to the churches here. He said, you've lost your first love. And it's very, very easy to, what happens, I believe, it, it, that, you know, even the very best of things. You can be on a, on a des- deserted island and the only thing you've got to eat is, is lobster. And how many people know you can get sick of lobster? <laughs> the only thing you've got to eat is this or whatever it might be. And you get sick of it. But I want to tell you, Friend, what happens, and I'm not saying we get sick of God, but what happens, you can have the very presence of God. You can have the anointing of God and familiarity breeds contempt. And somewhere or other, we get so familiar with the good things that all of a sudden, it it just becomes same old, same old. Friend, can I say to this, don't ever lose your first love for God. So somehow or other, get up of a morning and throw your hands in the air and start crying out saying, God, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you, amen. Let the Spirit of God get inside us. Never lose that first love. When the music plays and and that, throw your hands in the air and give God your worship, amen. Worship the King, hallelujah. That's how you do it, friends. I want to just read a little bit here in uh, the book of Romans. I just want to remind us of this again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't allow the world to to fashion you the way it wants to fashion you. We are not people of this world. We are people of another kingdom in Jesus' name. We live in this world, but we're not going to allow it to dominate and control us. But it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be transformed, to be changed. Somehow or other that we, we can allow the Spirit of God. I don't know, the children today have got these toys that one minute they look like one thing and then a few minutes later they, they look like some giant. Is anybody else or are you, or are you guys too old who have played with children's toys lately? Hey? Hey? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, they call them transformers, amen. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's good to see something like that to understand that God wants to take this negative, broken down, whatever you, however you feel about yourself, because that's not who you are. He wants to take you and He wants to transform you into a giant, devouring, Holy Ghost champion. <laughs> How many people want to be like that, Amen. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. I want to tell you, friends, our mind, our mind, our mind is the enemy. Our mind is the enemy. And and it says here, and it says, Behold, I stand at the door. This is Revelation 3.20. At the door and I knock. Can I say it again? God is very, 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 very interested in the church. And today He stands at the door of your life. And God is knocking. God wants to come in. He just doesn't want to be out there somewhere. He wants to come in. He wants to be part of us. He wants to come into our lives. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Now, I want you to understand this. Jesus is talking about standing at the door of the church. 
which we automatically think that He is everywhere that He wants to be. He's not. Because many times we shut the door that allows Him to come in to do what He wants to do with us. With us. Did I kind of talk like this? But He says to you and to me, Neil, I'm standing at the door of your life. I'm knocking. Will you open up the door and allow me to come in? Will you allow me to come in? I want to dine with you and you with me. I want to have a relationship with you. Friend, I want to say this to you today, that God wants to come into your life, not just so as that He can have a feed with you, but He wants to empower you. He wants to ignite your life. He wants to open up revelation knowledge to you. He wants to show you the mysteries of God. He wants to show you what He can do through your life because He's building His church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church that He builds. I stand at the door and I knock. If you open the door, I will come in. How many people say, I will come in? And dine with him and he with me. Then he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. God wants you to overcome the wiles of the enemy. He wants you, because if he comes in, he said, I will cause you to overcome. And you will come and sit with me upon my throne, even as I have overcome. Now we think that Jesus came, and when he came, he was so full of the power, so full of the anointing, so full of everything like that, that it was just like a, a tip throat toe through the tulips with tiny Tim. But I want to tell you, friend, Jesus was buffeted. He was beaten. He was uh, everything possible to get him off course. But he said, I overcame, and because I overcame, you can overcome. You want to overcome today? That's a good thing, amen. Then it says, then he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I believe that God wants to do amazing things. I believe that the, 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 um, the greatest enemy of the church today is the world system. Church is being well. The church is being overtaken by the world. Success today in churches mainly is our numbers. How many have you got? God doesn't mind numbers. He wrote a book and called it Numbers. I want you to have a quick look at, with me in the book of Matthew. Matthew 21. In verse 12, it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So as I said before, God is watching over his church. He's going to do great things in the church, I believe. And this is what amazed me, is here's the church of the living God, but he said these words that really, really shook me. He says, you have made my church a den of thieves. Friend, we can make the church whatever we want to make it. You've got to remember this. Jesus said, I will build my church. If I can say this again and again and again, Jesus wants His church back. We have tried to build the church. We have tried, friend, can I hear an amen? We have tried to build the church with good ideas, with great ideas. And, and numbers have come. We've had free cappuccino, free pizza, free this. And friend, I'm not against all this stuff, please, please. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. 
And Jesus just goes through his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And here he is, people hosanna and crying out and things like that. And he goes into the temple and the, what he does is he drives out the money changers. He drives out those that sold doves. He turned over the tables and goodness knows what. And he said these words that will put a ripple through us. Friend, you have made my house a den of iniquity. They're strong words, friend. But he said, my church, my house will be a house of prayer. God is building his church. I wanna tell you friends, we have to come to a point in the kingdom of God where we say, Father, I wanna seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God, it doesn't matter about anything else. It doesn't matter whether it's this or that, but my God, we seek your presence more than anything else. We just want your presence to fill this place. We want your glory to come down. My God, that you will change us from the inside out, that we would be transformed into the very image of God, that we would be transformed and changed Lord, that we would be filled with your power and with your authority. You see, I'm not talking a silly talk here. God says, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of Satan and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But the church can go walk around like a lame duck. Void of power, void of victory, void of everything. But God says, I want to empower you. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost is upon you. Friend, we have been empowered. We have been infilled. We have, we, we have the greatest power on earth living inside of us. That's the truth. And we've got to stir ourselves up. It's no good walking around saying this or that and complaining and grumbling when the problem is that we have made this house what it is. But he said, my father's house will be a house of prayer. And God will come in and he will turn over the money tables. He will do what he's got to do. I believe that, amen. Help us, Father. He's standing at the door. He's knocking. He's wanting to come in. He's coming in. Turned over the money things. God's plan for man is to overcome the wiles of the enemy and release and realise that we are created in God's image. And the direction of the church is to be Christ-like or Christ-likeness. I'm going to do a study on that shortly. Jesus came, overcame every temptation. He, was, he triumphed over Satan's attack. He won the prize, the salvation of mankind. There's a war raging as we speak. Satan is trying to lull the church to sleep. The, uh, the, the fundamental foundation truths are being discarded. Jesus didn't come to earth to play tiddlywinks. He came to destroy the works of Satan. He came to, to show the world how to live. He made bold statements. I love Jesus. I love these bold statements where he stood up and he said, I am the way, I am the truth. <laughs> I am the way, I am the truth. No man comes to the Father except through me. Yes, he, he made statements, like, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes. He, he spoke things into, the, into existence and they're still echoing through the chambers of this world right now. Yes. And if you can grab hold of it, it's yours, amen? You've got to realise that the situation where we have made, I have made my life. It's surrendering. Jesus, here I am. Take over. I love, I love the, that, that movie. I often, you remember I wrote out that thing, that woman's prayer. Satan, <laughs> I want you to hear something. This house is under new management. <laughs> Amen. This house is under new management. 
But the fundamental foundations, truths are being discarded. And I believe it's time to come back to the foundations of our life, amen? You know, today the cross is just a nice polished piece of brass or whatever it might be that sits on a mantle or something like that. But the cross represents a lot more than that, doesn't it? On the cross, the cross, the old rugged cross, the amazing cross. Jesus didn't come to earth to play tiddlywinks. He came as a lamb to be slaughtered. And he rose a man of war. He rose a man of war. He arose a victor of the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Up from the grave he arose. A mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. With his saints to reign. To reign, not to sit around like a jellyfish, but to reign and to rule in life, amen. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ arose. He's alive, he's risen. Do you believe that today? He arose, he arose, he arose. He was despised and rejected. He was brutally abused. They spat on him, they jeered him, they, they did everything. They laughed at him, they, they, they stripped him naked. They, they, they lashed his back with 39 lashes till his back and it was just an open wound. Many, many men, they say, died on that whipping pole. They led him through the streets, Jerusalem. People spitting at him, laughing at him. He had 12 legions of angels that he could have called down at any time and would have smitten every person. But the Bible says as they, as they drove those nails into his hand and to his feet and as they threw that big thing, that cross into that hole, and as he hung there, there was a smile on his face He's saying, you idiots, you do not know what you are doing. I will rise again. I will lead captivity captive. I will build my church and every devil in hell will cringe. Jesus didn't go through all of that to see his church go down the toilet. Amen? How many people know that Jesus believes in the church? He believes that we're going to rise up. He believes that we're going to do it. He believes that we're going to, he, he believes it. The church can become a social event. Today, alcohol flows like a river. If you're not careful, it'll take you out. A lot of people in the church have given up on the church. But I want to say to you, God hasn't given up on the church. Turn to somebody and say, God hasn't given up on us. God hasn't given up on us. When, when leaders of the church give up on the church, it becomes either a social gospel or a legalistic set of rules and regulations that bind people in control. Jesus said, I've come to set you free, amen. Amen. I want you to be free. I want you to be free. Jesus came to set us free. Friend, friend, will you stand with me today? Musicians, would you come? You know, Jesus made some amazing statements. One of the statements he said is you must be born again. Friend, it's very important that we must be born again. Make sure you're born again. You can go to church all your life and not be born again. We must be born again. As a, as a people, we've got to realise, you know, sometimes we're complaining about the building that we've built ourselves. Lest the Lord build the house, they that build it labour in vain. Lord, we realise today that you paid an amazing price. We let our mind, we let our thinking Go to see you hanging on that cross, blood streaming from your body. 
My God, we, we see you there as, as you look among the people as they're, as they're laughing and jeering and, 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 and mocking, as the two thieves mocked you. But my God, as you were there, and one of the thieves, as he rebuked the other thief, and then he turned to you and he said to you, Jesus, would you remember me? And Lord, right there at the cross, before you'd even given up your life, but you'd paid that amazing price, there was one that was turning to you. And my God, I pray that as it began with people turning to you, Lord, at the end time, there will be a masses that will be turning to you. Lord, that the church would turn back to you, my God. We would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And my God, that we would believe that you would just pour out your blessing upon us. And my God, I'm asking you today that us in this building here today, Lord, as we stand in your presence, that we would have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. My God, that you're standing at our door and you're knocking at our door. You're knocking at this door of this, of this group of people called Global Connections. But my God, you're knocking on the door of us as individuals. And you're asking, will you open the door? Will you open the door? Will you allow me to come in? Will you allow me to penetrate that dark darkness in your life? Will you let me penetrate that thing that, that, that keeps you awake in the middle of the night? Will you allow me to set you free? So you can be everything that I want you to be. My church, my people. Father, I'm just asking you today, by your spirit, Lord, that you would touch our lives and meet with us today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. you might be here in this house today, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can ask him to come into your life. He will come in. It's very, very simple. You ask him to come into your life. You may be here today and God's put his spotlight on something in your life that you just need to deal with. You can deal with that in your seat, I know. But you can deal with it too as you come to the front and just acknowledge it, not before man, but just before God.